Tartary is a mysterious country about which nothing was heard at all 20 years ago. Students of historical faculties did not discuss it, they did not talk about it in the kitchens of Soviet Khrushchevs. It was as if no one knew about her. And then 10 years ago, there was some kind of information breakthrough, and even the presidents began to talk about Tartary. On the 19th of January, 2000 of the 17th year, Vladimir Putin presented a gift to the former president of Tatarstan, Mintimir Shemiv, a map of ancient Tartary by 17th century cartographer, William Bly. At first glance, this is just a revolutionary event. With this gift, Putin seems to confirm that there are catastrophic inconsistencies and white spots in our history. The authorities seem to have decided to rewrite history rehabilitated in Tartary. But this is at first glance. Vladimir Putin's gift to Mintimir Shemiv does not change anything at all in the history of Russia and Europe. Putin himself has not commented on his attitude to the mythical Tartary. Instead, the official point of view was conveyed to people by the state television channel Russia One. Sergei Buryulev, the official correspondent of Russia One released the film Shemiv in Search of Tartary, is a good movie. There is a lot of information about the achievements of Dear Shemiv, but there is a little about Tartary. You can watch the video yourself link in the description. The main idea of Brilyev's film is that there is nothing mysterious in Tartary. These lands used to be occupied by the Tatar-Mongol hordes, and Tartary is practically the Golden Horde. Russia One brings to people the official point of view on the history of Tartary. And from the official point of view, Tartary is roughly speaking the lands occupied by the Mongol Tatars. When the Golden Horde fell into decline, the lands of Tartary joined Muscovy and China. It's a good version, but if we look at maps from Soviet history textbooks, namely the territories occupied by the Golden Horde during its dawn, then we get inconsistencies. On the maps of the 17th-18th centuries, the Tartaries occupy most of the continent of Eurasia up to Novaya Zemlyu and Kamchatka. Some maps even refer to Alaska as Tartary. According to Bryulev, all these territories were controlled by the Golden Horde, but on maps from Soviet textbooks, the Golden Horde, although it controlled vast territories, did not occupy the lands of the northern regions of Siberia, and these are huge territories of hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. On the maps of the 17th century, these are all the territories of Tartary, so the officials, with the help of Bryulev's film, wanted to very elegantly give these territories to the Golden Horde and close all conversations about the mysterious Tartary, but it seems to me that they did not do it very evidently. According to the version of the main museum cartographer of Russia from the film Berlevo, foreigners believed that Asia does not extend very far to the north, and the Caspian Sea is a bay of the ocean. Then, in the 13th century, the first travelers went to China, and from these travelers, Europeans learned that Asia stretches far to the north, and these lands are called Tartary. With the 13th century, everything is clear. European cartographers had a vague idea of the size of Asia and therefore could call these lands Tartary, that is, the edge of the world. But we are now transported from the dense 13th to the 18th century. The ships of the East India Company have been exporting goods from India for more than 50 years. In 1711 year, the company founded a trade representative office in China for the purchase of tea. All this suggests that Europeans have already studied the coast of Southeast Asia quite well. The outlines of both Americas are already being mapped. And at this time, European cartographers are drawing maps of Tartary. And it can no longer be said that these lands are at the edge of the earth. The mythical Golden Horde has already disappeared into oblivion and on the map of 1714th year. This territory is still called Grand Tartary. European cartographers did not forget to draw the recently appeared Muscovy, but for some reason, according to the chief cartographer, they did not change the name of Tartary in any way because he believes that Tartary is a territory that was controlled by the Golden Horde. But the Horde has already disappeared. And after the collapse of the Golden Horde, new states appeared, for example, Muscovy, Persia, Turkey and China. New states have appeared, but most of Siberia and the Far East is still occupied by the Grand Tartary. For some reason, in the 18th century, according to the chief Russian cartographer, no one controls these vast lands.
Further, in the film Biuliovo, the great cartographer generally deals with the substitution of concepts. He does not tell who actually led the huge Grand Tartary, but says that Russia and China defeated the last stronghold of Tartary, the Kingdom of Kiva, at the end of the 19th century. But the Kingdom of Kiva is quite far from the Grand Tartary, and most likely has nothing to do with it. Sergei Buryulev in his film really wanted to belittle the importance of the Grand Tartary and mix its image with the Mongol Tatars and the Golden Horde. There is almost nothing left of the Grand Tartary in world history, but sometimes a very interesting fact comes across. Let's take a look at the city fortifications of Beijing. They were built at the beginning of the 15th century. The wall is 24 kilometers long, 15 meters high, and 20 meters thick. The wall stood for 530 years, and were demolished in 1965th year due to the construction of the Second Ring Road and the Beijing Subway Line. Look at this plan, it clearly states that it was a Tartar city. As we know, the nomads of the Golden Horde did not even build such capital structures in their homeland. It seems that this is what the cities of Tartary looked like. Look at the map of 1652nd year. For some reason, the territory of Tartary and North America are circled in the same color, as if these territories were under common administration. In 1730, the French-Canadian explorer Pierre Gaudier de Warren, during an expedition to the west of the Great Lakes, found a very interesting stone decorated with unknown writings. The stone was on top of a small pyramid of stones, it was about 30 centimeters long, 10 centimeters wide. The stone was sent to Quebec, where the Jesuit priests came to the conclusion that the inscription on the stone was made in the Tartar language. The stone, along with other artifacts, was sent to Rennes, where it remained until the Second World War. During the bombing, the cathedral in which the stone was located was destroyed. The Minnesota Historical Society has offered a reward of $1,000 for help in finding the stone. So the Jesuits of the 18th century knew very well what the Tartar letter looked like. Here is another interesting announcement of 1849th year. It says about some kind of musical event and that there will be a translation of this event into six languages Russian, German, English, French, Tartar, and Italian. Why is the Tartar language mentioned among the most common languages of the world? Even if we theoretically assume that the Tartar language was called the language that is now called Tatar and is most common in Tatarstan. How many people in the world could speak it in the middle of the 19th century? Probably no more than 500,000 people, because according to the population census of 1989, only 5 million people spoke Tatar on the territory of the Soviet Union. And it turns out that, among the main languages spoken by millions in the middle of the 19th century. The language of a very small language group, Tatarstan was represented. Therefore, I think in this article, the languages of the main states of the world were represented, and Tartar was one of the most common languages back in the 19th century. Brilov associates Tartary with the Golden Horde. The Golden Horde collapsed and disappeared in the 13th century, but the Tartar language is still actively used in the 19th century. Also, the non-existent country had its own flags, and they were printed in the British Table of Ship Flags in 1783rd year. And again, if you believe Berlev's film, Tartary is practically a Golden Horde, a state of nomads, that disappeared in the 13th century. So why add to the Table of Sea Flags the flag of a country that has not existed for several centuries. The flag of the governor of Moscow is also interesting in this table. For some reason, the flag is decorated with stars and tatter sabers. It turns out that on the maps of the 18th century, there is a huge country called Grand Tartary. There are references to the Tartar language in 19th century advertisements, and this language had the same influence as the main European languages. Even the monks and Jesuits knew the Tartar language and immediately recognized it on a stone found in North America. Tartary seems to have all the signs of a real power, but for some reason, there are no coins, jewelry, cities left from this empire.
As for the cities, the question is of course complicated, but there are quite a lot of gold ornaments of ancient Tartary left. Everyone has heard about Scythian gold, which was extracted from a mound in Siberia. On this topic, I have a video. A link in the description. Russia has known two periods of grave digging. The first one occurred at the end of the 17th, at the beginning of the 18th century. Then, the masses of migrants rushed to the undeveloped expanses of Siberia. It was impossible not to notice the huge mounds of the Siberian tribe's skiff, their obvious man-made nature fueled greedy curiosity. The one who first ventured to dig an eight-meter-high embankment shaft and penetrate the burial chamber was generously rewarded with a huge amount of gold items. Soon the gold rush swept all of Siberia. People with whole families went to this fishery to charring, looting of mounds. The found items were most often melted down and sold under a canopy. No one considered these items as unique historical artifacts. For a short time, the hillbillers were engaged in their trade with impunity. At the beginning of the 18th century, Peter the Great issued a decree to execute such grave diggers with death if they were caught. Robbers also got it from the native population. The latter, considering the mounds as the graves of their ancestors, killed the hillbillers on the spot. Since the baggers had no information about archaeological sites in Siberia, the search for suitable mounds was conducted according to signs. The geometric correctness of the shapes, as the main feature of the mound, could not be counted on. The fact is that in the Siberian steppes, such a phenomenon as Kamensi is widespread, outcrops of rocky rock that look like mounds. The surest sign that the suspicious hill found was a mound was the presence of ground squirrels on it, eternal companions of human graves. This led to some superstitions of the buggers. Before starting work on the mound, it was considered mandatory to feed the gopher. It was strictly forbidden to ruin the burrow of gophers so as not to discourage gold. It was considered a particularly good sign if the gophers did not run away when a person appeared on the mound because it was a sign that the mound had not yet been looted. After making sure that the mound was not looted, the hillmen after praying and feeding the ground squirrels set to work. They dug a curtain on the slope of the mound to the stone vault, after which they carefully tapped it and, together with the loudest sound, punched a hole through which they penetrated into the burial. The usual earner of the hillbillers were products made of gold, silver, copper, and bronze. In addition, in Buryasha and Transbarkalia, the boomers did not disdain such prey as human bones, which were actively bought up by Buddhist lamas for the preparation of medicines and rituals. According to the official history, the gold from the mounds belongs to the mysterious Scythian civilization, which left no written language behind, but left a thousand mounds with gold products. We also have a mysterious state of Tartary, after which there were maps, sea flags, and mysterious notes in newspapers about the Tartar language. But this state did not leave behind any tangible objects in the form of coins or gold jewelry. It seems to me that we just need to combine these two facts, and this will help us with the book by William Tuck published in 1800, in which on 448th page, it is told about the Tartar tombs on the Volga and in Siberia, and the author writes exactly the Tartar tombs about not the tombs of the Scythians. So at the beginning of the 19th century, the Scythians had not yet been invented, and all these treasures from the mounds were attributed to their real owners, Tartars. The shores of the mythical Tartary are washed by the Tartar Ocean as it should be. On other maps, it is signed as the Tartar IC. Let's go back to Putin. With his gift, he wanted to draw public attention to the official point of view of the authorities on this issue, to show that the authorities know about the maps of Tartary and simply consider them the lands of the Golden Horde, and all this clearly fits into the framework of official history. But I completely disagree with this. All the facts indicate that Tartary was an independent state until the beginning of the 18th century, and, most likely, the history of Tartary intersects with the history of Alaska and North America. Here is an interesting excerpt from the book 1834th year, which I found on the Stolen History Forum. A very interesting phrase 
is Tartars, or Indians, as they are now called. It seems that the history of Tartary has ended in North America. That's it. Watch my channel.